the Hudson Library and Historical Society's 2016 Authors Series presents H.W. Brands, author, educator, and historian, the author of 25 books and two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, speaking about his latest historical biography, Reagan, The Life. A new look at the life of the 40th President of the United States, one of the two most influential presidents of the 20th century. Recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on March 3rd, 2016. But next Wednesday evening, we are hosting um, two gentlemen that have literally walked in Marco Polo's footsteps and done a whole film about it. It's a joint venture between Western Reserve Academy and the Hudson Library. And they're coming to speak about their experience walking in Marco Polo's footsteps, in the footsteps of Marco Polo, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. A week from this evening, the past director of the American Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian, Mr. Brent Glass is coming. Brent has written a wonderful book about um, historic places in Ohio and <coughs> historic preservation. And the reason he's coming to Hudson, Ohio is that um, a year and a half ago I received the proofread copies of his book because Hudson was mentioned. Uh, and I had to say, yes, this is accurate history. So I believe we get three or four pages in his book. Wow. And he has been to Hudson previously, but he has not seen it since we've done our whole redevelopment. And he will be returning, and he'll talk to you about historic preservation throughout the United oh. States, and he might have a complimentary thing to say about Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> also upcoming um, is uh, Pamela Smith-Hill, and she has done the annotated autobiography of Laura Ingalls Wilder. In case you don't know, it was on the New York Times bestsellers list, and it is by far the best book I have ever written read about Laura Ingalls Wilder. It's chock full of accurate history um, regarding her lifetime, as well as annotations to the series of books, Little House on the Prairie. Um, I'm personally delighted to tell you about the fourth great-granddaughter of Charles Dickens. Her name is Lucinda Hoxley. And she is coming April 26th, I believe. It's either April or May 26th. Um, from England, literally. And she has written a biography of Princess Louise. Now, who is Princess Louise? She is Victoria, Queen Victoria's rebellious daughter. Um, she is quite the rebel, and she ended up um, marrying a gentleman from Canada and spending most of her life in North America as opposed to England. So Lucinda will be here, and she'll give us a hint about her upcoming book about her fourth great-grandfather, Charles Dickens. Um, there are phenomenal programs. Uh, the di Is it the Diary of the Comma Queen? The, um, she is coming. Um, there are numerous um, novelists that are coming to Hudson, Ohio. I encourage you all to take a moment and look at our forthcoming programs, both on the web at www.hudsonlibrary.org and in the brochures. So that's one commercial down. The second commercial is for the Learned Owl. Three cheers for the Learned Owl. Yeah. Yeah. We have an independent bookstore in our town that is much beloved. And they are generally, at most of our programs, selling the author's books. And they will in, indeed, again, be here tonight selling um, Mr. Brand's books. And he'll sign at the reception immediately after this. Um, fourth commercial really isn't a commercial because I'm officially at work. But I'm just reminding you and encouraging you all that these programs are supported through your tax dollars. And you have the ability to express your opinions 
at a certain election on March 15th. <laughs> and while the rest of the world may think that Super Tuesday was yesterday, in Ohio, Super Tuesday is coming up. Right? March 15th. March 15th. Um, beyond that, let me think what else I have to tell you. There's a little box in the back for donations if you so feel inclined. Um, we will take a few brief questions in here, but I'm not going to take a great number of them because I want to make sure that you have time to interact with Mr. Brands at the reception. I'm also not going to tell you this man's vast resume. In case you don't watch the History Channel, I honestly believe you cannot turn on the History Channel at least once a week and see his face. Um, he is a resident um, commentator on many historical um, publications there, and he has written numerous books. I've read three of them, including the Ronald Reagan one, which he will speak about. Um, he is an extensive author. He is a, quite literally a scholar. He is still teaching class and traveling. He told me he teaches on Monday and Wednesdays at, at the University of Texas at Austin. So if there are any UT fans out here, you might give him a cheer. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I want to say thank you to Hudson Cable, who are here filming, for those of you that cannot be here this evening to enjoy this. We truly appreciate having our own little cable company in town um, to make sure that things like this are accessible to everyone. We're good? Without further ado, please welcome H.W. Brand. Thank you, Grant, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be back in Hudson at the Hudson Library. I am flattered to be part of the series, and I'm just reminded of all the great authors who are coming through. So to be part of this group is a wonderful thing. I'm also very flattered that you came out on a cold night. I teach at the University of Texas at Austin, and I have a class that is very much larger than this group. I'm teaching a class that has almost 500 students. But I know perfectly well that if those students were not required to be there, if they weren't going to be <laughs> tested on the material, some of them, some of them would not show up. You're not going to be tested. You don't have to be here, but you took time out of your evening to come. So that is something that I really appreciate. So thank you. I'm going to tell you about a book that I wrote on Ronald Reagan. And I'm going to begin by telling you a story. This is a story that's about Ronald Reagan. It's a story that Ronald Reagan told about himself. And that part is important. So there is a moral to this story, but we'll leave the moral till later. The story is set in a small town somewhere in the American Midwest. It could have been, eh, conceivably it could have been in Ohio. More likely it was in Illinois. And this, well, because Ronald Reagan was a son of Illinois. He grew up in small town Illinois. But there's another reason. A lot of Reagan's stories were set in small towns in the Midwest. And this because Reagan understood that if you, put, if you set a story somewhere in a small town in the Midwest, then you can speak to all Americans. If you say, this was a small town in Massachusetts, the West Coast feels this isn't their story. If you say, this is in a suburb of San Diego, New England just waves it off. But if it's in the heartland, then Americans throughout the country we will pay attention. So this story is set in a small town somewhere in the Midwest. And it takes place in about the late 1950s, maybe early 1960s. Now, this is a revealing, a critical period for Ronald Reagan, as you will see as the story unfolds. But the story has Reagan about to give a speech a lunchtime speech at the local. It could have been the Chamber of Commerce. It might have been the Rotary Club. It could have been the Elks. Any one of these groups that has luncheon speakers. And he is he's been scheduled to give this speech. And there's an individual member of the, the, the group who is going to introduce Ronald Reagan. But here's the catch. Here's the problem. He, the guy, the introducer, I will call him, gets the printed program, and he sees this name, Ronald, R-E-A-G-A-N. And he's not quite sure how to pronounce the name. 
Now, the reason for this is, this requires a little bit of explanation, because it's set in this particular moment in the life of this guy, Ronald, R-E-A-G-A-N, where he used to be kind of famous, not really famous. He was a movie actor, but he wasn't a really good movie actor. He was a pretty good movie actor, but not, not sort of the, not the Clark Gable of his era, you know? And he, he never quite made the, the top of the marquee. He was always kind of the next one. If he had, he never was nominated for an Academy Award, but it always would have been for a supporting actor. It wouldn't have been for the lead. And this is the hinge of this particular story because the introducer sees the program and he is not quite sure how to pronounce this last name. R-E-A-G-A-N. It could be Regan, it could be Reagan. Each one is reasonably plausible, especially if you have never heard the name pronounced. And so he's, well, he's not quite sure what to do because he doesn't want to get it wrong. It would embarrass the guest. He would embarrass himself. It would embarrass the group. It's just not good form. Now, I tell this story to my students and they're just thinking, well, you know, just go on YouTube or, you know, <laughs> go on the internet, Google or something and you get it right away. Well, I, I point out to them that there was a time when the internet did not exist. And so, in this story, the introducer is, he's just puzzling over this. He's getting more and more worried as the, the noon hour approaches. And he goes for a walk, and this is a small town, he goes for a walk in the, around the town. And he's sort of saying to himself, is it Reagan, is it Regan, what is it? And he's not really paying too much attention to where he's going. And walking along, he bumps into one of his neighbors. Actually, he bumps into the neighbor's dog. The neighbor's out walking the dog. And, and so the neighbor says, gee, you look like you're really worried. What's going on? Is everything OK? And the guy starts to answer. And instead of sort of explaining, he just takes the program and he thrusts it in the neighbor's hand. He says, there it is. Do you know how to pronounce this guy's name? I got to introduce him. And the, the neighbor with the dog says, it looks at it and says, oh yeah, yeah, I remember this guy. He used to be an actor. And uh, it's, it's Ronald Reagan. And the guy says, and the introducer says, are you sure? You sure? It's, it's Reagan. It's not Reagan. It's Reagan. He says, yeah, yeah, it's Reagan. I remember. He, he, was, he used to be in some movies back there in the 30s, but you know, no, nobody's heard from him in a long time, but, but that's it, I'm sure. And the guy says, oh man, you have saved me from the worst kind of embarrassment. I don't know how I can thank you. Oh, don't worry, just, you know, just go introduce him and have, uh, do a good job. And uh, so the guy starts walking off and he's saying to himself, Reagan, Reagan, Reagan. And he bumps into the dog again. <laughs> and he says, oh, by the way, that's a really cute dog. What kind of dog is that? And the guy says, a bagel. <laughs> Okay, now I want, you to, I, want you to can, I want you to can that laughter and hold on to it. Because, because there's, there is a moral to this story and I'm gonna come around to the moral of the story, okay? And, well, so I'm gonna tell you another story. This is another Reagan story. Now this is one where Reagan has once again become famous, really famous. Just to sort of recapitulate. Reagan grew up in this small town in Illinois. The family jumped from town to town because his father, well, couldn't keep a job, and they finally landed in Dixon, Illinois. And that's where Reagan spent most of his grade school years and high school years. And, and then he went off to college at Eureka College in Illinois. And then, and then he, well, he had decided sometime when he was in college that he wanted to try his luck in Hollywood. So he didn't go to Hollywood right away. He went into radio first. Then he went to Hollywood. And he took a screen test and the camera liked him. And he thought, okay, this is gonna be my career. And he launched this film career. But the film career really only lasted about, really about four years. Because he, he went there in 1937 and he was making films. He was a, a B movie actor. How many of you remember B movies? Okay, and you remember double features, all right? Well, they're the, the bottom rung on the, the double features. Anyway. <laughs> 
So he goes off there, and the way Reagan remembered things was that his career was just starting to take off when World War II began. And then he got sidetracked. He had to go off to war. Well, he actually didn't go off to war. He went from Hollywood to Culver City, which is 15 miles down the road <laughs> in Southern California. And he made movies for the Army. And so these, some of them were training films. Some of them were sort of morale-building films and the like. And then the way Reagan tells the story, by the time he got out of, by the time the war ended and he got out of the Army, the audiences had forgotten about it. And so that's, that was sort of the beginning of the end of his movie career. He went into the politics of the film business. He became an officer, a member of the board, and then president of the Screen Actors Guild. And this is when he first, he got his first taste of politics. And it was industry politics, but it was politics nonetheless. And in fact, the industry politics intersected with the politics of the country during this era because this was when the communist scare of the late 40s and early 1950s was an important influence on American public and cultural life. And some of you will remember, or some of you will remember reading about in the history books, that there was this thing called the House on American Activities Committee, which was trying to make sure that the communists had not infiltrated schools, libraries, movies. And Reagan, as head of the Screen Actors Guild, was asked to weigh in on this. And this is when he first, he made his first sort of national public appearance. He spoke before the HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee. But even that part of his Hollywood career eventually faded out. You can only be president of the Actors Guild for so long. And he discovered he couldn't get any good movie roles. And he basically kind of washed out of movies. But he washed into television. Now, these days, the top actors in the country make TV shows, TV series. They like it. They can stay home. You know, they can do all this stuff. But in those days, how many of you, and I don't mean to date any of you, but, but how many of you remember TV in the 50s? Okay, you know, the, these little screens, and they were fuzzy, and you couldn't see anything. Well, this was, Reagan got demoted from the big screen of movies to the little screen of television. And what he was, was the, how many of you remember Reagan as host of the General Electric Theater? Any of you? Okay. Well, uh, not many people watched, and, but some of you remembered. But I bet you remember because he went, went on to become famous in his second career. Anyway, so, but the thing that most people at the time didn't realize was that being host of the GE Theater, first of all, it really was a huge demotion for somebody who had had in mind to be this film star, because he wasn't even the star of the GE Theaters. These are these made-for-TV plays, basically, once a week. He was simply the introducer. He would say who the stars actually were. But most of his week was spent traveling the United States on behalf of GE, General Electric. And he would give speeches to GE assembly plant workers. He would give speeches to, well, small town, rotary club, chamber of commerce, things like this. And this was what he did. And it was quite a step down for this guy who had hoped to become this movie star. And he had no idea at this point, no one had any idea, that he was going to go into politics. But he turned out to, well, he had developed his interest in politics. He educated himself to politics while he was on the road for GE. Sometimes I think of these as Reagan's wilderness years, where the world had forgotten him, and they hadn't rediscovered him. But he got his chance at a critical moment in 1964. And the moment came because the Republicans had nominated a very conservative candidate, sort of like the Republicans seem likely to do this time around, <laughs> except, <laughs> except that this very conservative candidate was a very well-respected establishment politician, Barry Goldwater, a senator of Arizona. But he was also a terrible candidate, and he was going to lose the election very badly. Ronald Reagan, while spending most of his time working for GE, had 
begun to give speeches on behalf of political candidates in Southern California, where he lived. He lived in Hollywood. And this was in the days when, well, it was the days before television figured out what to do with political campaigns, or maybe vice versa, maybe political campaigns hadn't figured out what to do with television. And instead of the candidate going from town to town giving speeches that were covered in the national television news, that didn't happen at all. If you wanted to get the word out, then people spoke on your behalf various places around the country. And Reagan started speaking on behalf of Republican candidates in Southern California. And he'd been trained as an actor. He had honed his speaking skills, giving these lunchtime talks for GE. And so some of the people thought, well, why don't we have him speak on behalf of Barry Goldwater? And so a week before the 1964 election, Reagan gives this made for television speech. And it's a speech that is billed as, it's gonna be aired on TV, and in fact, these days with the miracle of YouTube, you can actually go and watch the speech. In Reagan lore, it's called the speech. And in fact, if you wanna try this, go home tonight or tomorrow and just go on Google and just type in the speech and up will pop Reagan in 1964, <laughs> late October. It has this kind of cachet because, because of, of what came afterwards. This, this is a digression a little bit, but I have a former student, a graduate of the University of Texas, who is a member of the, the current White House speechwriting team. So I was in Washington two weeks ago, and Suzanne, my former student, invited me to come talk to the speechwriting crew. I said, sure. And I actually happened to know one of the other people in the speechwriting crew anyway. So we sat down and we had lunch and we had a, a talk. And they were kind of asking my opinion, and I'm, I'm a presidential historian, sort of among other things, and they were asking my opinion on what makes a great presidential speech. And you know, this is, this is what they do. So they want to know, you know, from my historical, my historical perspective. And I say, well, I don't mean to discount the hard work that you do <laughs> and the fine speeches that you write, but there is no such thing as a great presidential speech absent great presidential action because presidential speeches come and go. It's what they lead to or what happens next that makes them important. The president, any president, can give the greatest speech in the world today and it'll be reported tomorrow and it'll be forgotten the day after tomorrow unless something comes of it. So, Ronald Reagan gave this speech in 1964 and it's called The Speech Now because of what it led to. Well. So if you do go on YouTube, as I did, and I've watched this four or five times, it's a very interesting thing to watch because, as I say, TV didn't know how to cover political campaigns and political campaigns didn't yet know how to use TV. So here was the deal. There were these Goldwater supporters who knew Reagan. They said, we're gonna put up the money for this. So they hired a hall in Los Angeles and they paid an audience to come occupy those chairs. <laughs> and the audience, the room was about this size and the audience was about this number. And they had, the, they all paid a dollar. You come in and you occupy that chair and here's what you're supposed to do. Have any of you ever been on any sort of television shows that have a live audience? Like, uh, you know, Jay Leno show or whoever Jay Leno's successor is, you know. You know and, and, you know, they get these instructions and if you've been on them, you know that when they go to commercial, then the band plays, and then when the commercial is about to end, because the, the TV audience doesn't see this, when the commercial is about to end, then the, lead, the head cheerleader comes up with a sign that says applause, applause, so when they come back in from commercial, everybody's, yeah, oh, they're having a great time. Okay, so this audience had instructions, and the instructions are these. Well, first of all, when they, when they walk in the room, they're handed these gold water signs. And the instructions are, every time the speaker mentions the name Goldwater. You jump up and down with these signs and you, you get really enthusiastic. So this is what they're gonna do. 
Now, other than that, these people are not particularly interested in politics. Uh, they're just kind of, they needed a dollar. So <laughs> there they are. So Reagan is standing up here. He stands behind a lectern. I should say, Reagan had been a film actor, and he had been this TV host. But he had never spoken politically on television before. So he had spoken to live groups, but he discovered that this audience was not really a live audience. <laughs> they were a pretty dead audience. And, but he also was used to speaking. You know, I'm a teacher at a university. And when you teach at a university, you think in terms of 50-minute blocks. So an academic hour is 50 minutes with 10 minutes for the students to get to the next class. So Reagan was used to speaking at 45 minutes or 50 minutes a block. He was only given 28 minutes because they could only pay for <laughs> half an hour. So it's clear he's got this speech that really is supposed to run about 45 minutes. And he knows he's got to talk fast to get through it. <laughs> so he's talking way too fast. And he's sort of running right over his, the lines that should have applause. But he's doing it partly because He's getting no response from this audience. He's used to you know, speaking to these groups and he tells jokes, and, but they're, he's talking too fast. They don't know what they're supposed to do. And, but here's the thing that really throws everybody off, at least throws the audience off. They're waiting for their cue. And their cue is Goldwater. Reagan gets halfway into this 30-minute speech, and he has yet to mention the name Goldwater. <laughs> And so this is kind of the old school with the cameras. They have one camera at the back, so that camera is focusing on the, the speaker. And then they have another camera that's focusing on the audience. So occasionally they flip from one to the other. And you see at first, so Reagan's behind here. And he's, he's uncomfortable because he's talking too fast and he's not getting any response out of this group and he doesn't know how this is going over. And then occasionally they go and they look at the audience. And the audience, they're all, all just standing there like this. <laughs> And they're, they've got these signs that are just resting on their laps. What are we supposed to do? But gradually, they start listening to him. And they start responding to him. And they realize that, wait a minute, this speech is not about Barry Goldwater. This speech is about Ronald Reagan. This speech is essentially Ronald Reagan's screen test for the career that is going to save his career. I told you his film career faded. His TV career, in fact, he had lost that GE gig. And he was, at this point, he was the host of, how many of you remember Reagan is the host of Death Valley Days? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. And so every, he'd get on there and he'd flog 20 mule team Borax. You know, he had gone from better living through electricity to, you know, scrub those hands. Anyway, so it was, this was a Hail Mary pass by Ronald Reagan, and he would have appreciated that analogy because Reagan was a big, well, you remember, remember the Gipper, you know, he was the Gipper in the, the, the movie about that. So, but Reagan realized that this was his one shot at a political career. And so he wasn't gonna waste it promoting Barry Goldwater. <laughs> he was gonna promote Ronald Reagan. Now, he didn't say vote for me or anything like that, but what he did was he basically took the philosophy of Barry Goldwater and portrayed it, conveyed it, in more arresting terms than Goldwater ever could. Furthermore, there was something that, how many of you remember Barry Goldwater as a candidate? Remember? Okay, a very conservative guy, but somebody who had this kind of scary edge to him. I mean, in his acceptance speech at the 64 National Convention, he was the one who said, that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And so basically he says, I'm an extremist. Americans don't like extremists. And they didn't like Barry Goldwater. They sort of, some of them liked his message, but Barry Goldwater put them off. Well, the most remarkable thing happened in the course of this 28 minute speech, because the audience, as I say, they gradually warmed to Reagan. And as they did, Reagan was getting the response from the audience that he was used to getting from the audiences that he spoke to in all these GE tours. And so he became more compelling. 
And this relationship developed between the two. And by the end of the speech, they had, everybody had forgotten this was about gold one. <laughs> and in fact, at, as the TV sets were turned off around the country, Republicans were saying, oh my gosh, we nominated the wrong guy. If we had nominated this guy, we might have a chance to win. And the Democrats were saying, we're glad they didn't nominate this guy. On the morning of that speech, almost no one in the United States, outside of a small part of Southern California where he had been speaking for other candidates before, almost no one in the United States associated Ronald Reagan and politics. They didn't think of those two in the same sort of breath or sentence. That's the morning before the speech. The next morning, the next morning, around the country already were forming Ronald Reagan for president <laughs> committees. Now, there has never been an entry into the political world like this. And Reagan burst on the political scene. A lot of people were surprised uh, that this sort of an actor who was never more than mediocre was going into politics and had done so effectively. In fact, Samuel Goldwyn, the Hollywood mogul of Metro Goldwyn Mayor, heard about, well, after this speech, Reagan didn't announce for president, he did announce for governor of California. And Goldwyn heard that Reagan was, gonna, was running for governor. And Goldwyn, remembering Reagan's acting day, said, no, no, no. Jimmy Stewart for governor, <laughs> Ronald Reagan for best friend. <laughs> and sort of that was, that was the initial response. Now I have to tell you that Reagan's political success did not come overnight. So he announced to the world basically that he was going into politics in 1964. He was 53 years old. Almost nobody starts a political career that late. But he entered politics. He was elected governor of California in 1966, the next time, the next time there was an election. And he ran, so he enters the governor's office in California at the beginning of 1967. This is the first public office he's held. In 1968, he decides to run for president. Now he didn't get very far at all that year. It was a bad year for well, it's a bad year for conservatives. Oh, I didn't tell you this, you will remember, that despite the Reagan speech, maybe because of the Reagan speech, uh, Barry Goldwater went down to a disastrous defeat. And there were all sorts of people in the Republican Party who said, that's the last time we go with such a conservative candidate. Conservatism, that is just taking us over the edge. Now, there was, at that point, and for the next several years, actually for the next 15 years, a battle for the soul of the Republican Party. Sound familiar? <laughs> and, and the question was, so what caused our defeat in 1964? And most of the party says, we nominated somebody who was too conservative. America is not that conservative. We need to nominate somebody who is more moderate. The conservatives, including Ronald Reagan, said, no, no. The problem was that the party didn't support the conservative candidate well enough. So Reagan ran as a conservative in 1968, and he lost. Richard Nixon got the nomination, and he won the presidency, which seemed to confirm the view of those who said, when the Republicans can choose a moderate, a more centrist candidate, they can win. And you'll remember that Nixon was reelected overwhelmingly in 1972. Ah, but then he ran into problems with that you know, Watergate stuff. <laughs> but anyway, my point in all this is that Reagan entered politics in 1964. He ran for president in 1968, did not get the nomination. He didn't run in 72 because he didn't challenge the incumbent Nixon. He did run in 1976, and in that case, he did challenge an incumbent, Gerald Ford. Except that Gerald Ford didn't have the stature of Richard Nixon because he hadn't been elected to the presidency. But it was a very controversial decision on Reagan's part to run for president in 1976 against an incumbent Republican. And he split the Republican vote, weakened Gerald Ford, who then lost to Jimmy Carter. Most people thought that Reagan, that was his last chance because he was already in his late 60s. And so Reagan loses in 76, 
And a lot of people sort of explained his decision to challenge Ford as a function of his age. He knew this was his last shot. So he loses, but then he surprises everybody by running in 1980. And this time, he did win the nomination and he won the presidency. So, that's a long way of getting around to the next second story I was going to tell you about, Ronald Reagan. This is one that Reagan told while he was president. And this is one that demonstrates a certain knack of Ronald Reagan. And that is, well, first of all, an ability to identify particular political groups, to pay attention to what their interests are, and more importantly, Reagan's ability to couch the most important, serious topics in humor. To, in fact, Reagan almost always started his speeches with a joke. Now, this speech is one that became famous or notorious, depending on your view of Reagan and what he said, as a speech in which he described the Soviet Union as the evil empire, the focus of evil in the modern world. This was Reagan at his most moralistic. Okay? But the speech began with a story. He's speaking to a national convention of evangelical ministers. This is in Orlando, Florida, their annual meeting. And so he begins by saying, so you see, there was in, uh, at one time, in a small town somewhere in the American Midwest, um, a beloved minister who had served his community for 50 years. And after his long, full, good life, he died. And his soul ascended to heaven, where he was met by St. Peter at the pearly gate. And St. Peter was about to explain the way heaven worked and the stuff you need to know, sort of the orientation process to heaven. When they're interrupted, because it turns out on the very same day, in the very same town, a long time and by no means so beloved or universally respected politician died. And unaccountably, his soul ascended to heaven, where he runs into the beloved minister and St. Peter there at the pearly gates. So, St. Peter gives them both the orientation speech. And this is what we do and all this stuff. And then St. Peter says, okay, now I'm going to show you to your quarters. This is where you're going to live for all eternity. So they start walking through the streets of heaven. And unbeknownst to the politician, probably to the minister too, turns out that there are different kinds of neighborhoods in heaven. <laughs> and they get into this one neighborhood that's looking kind of seedy. And the politician's getting a little bit worried. Oh my God, this is where I'm going to live. And they turn into something that looks to all the world like a public housing project. And they go inside, and it's as grim as can be. And they go into one of the rooms. And the room is bare, except for this cot and a straight back chair and a table. And that's it. And the politicians think, oh my gosh. But St. Peter turns to the minister and he says, this is where you'll be staying. These are your quarters for all eternity. And the minister, okay. And the politician is mystified. And at first he thinks, Whew. but then he thinks, oh, wait a minute. If this is what the minister gets, what's in store for me? <laughs> so they walk out of the housing project and they're walking down the street and they keep walking and the neighborhood improves until they're walking through this leafy residential neighborhood that's finer than anything the politician has ever seen. And they turn onto the nicest street of all, and there at the end of the street is this gorgeous mansion. And it's got flowers and trees and fountains and everything. And 
the politician is kind of looking around to see if there's anybody else there. And St. Peter says, and this is where you're going to be living. And the politician is stunned. And he says, well, gee, I'm, thank you. Uh, but St. Peter, do you mind? Can I ask you a question? And St. Peter says, sure. He says, well, please explain. Um, how is it that that good, holy man of the cloth, that minister, got that lousy, almost prison cell, and I got this gorgeous mansion. And St. Peter says, well, you got to understand how things are here in heaven. We've got lots of ministers. You're the first politician who ever got in. <laughs> okay. So the ministers in Reagan's audience, they're all oh, chuckling at this. Now, this is good. This guy's got a great sense of humor. Because notice, it is flattering to the audience. You are also holy, you're all going to get into heaven. And it's self-deprecating to the guy telling the story, the politician, Reagan. And it makes everybody laugh. Okay? Now this is absolutely crucial because it helps explain the enigma of Ronald Reagan. Now, there much has been made, too much has been made, of the so-called enigma of Reagan. And some of this is an artifact of, well, I would say biographies of Reagan that just didn't profess not to understand Reagan or to, the, the basic enigma for a whole lot of people, not exclusively liberals, but liberals especially, but even some conservatives was, how did this guy, this sort of modestly successful actor, become, well, I guess, I, I guess you could sort of explain away governor of California. You know, there's a lot, a lot of land and all that stuff. But president of the United States twice. <laughs> Furthermore, and arguably, the, one of the couple, one of the four or five most important presidents in all of American history. How did this guy do it? Now, some people have thought, that you need to get in the side, inside the head of Ronald Reagan to figure this out. I think that sort of misses the point, as I'll explain in a moment. But I will tell you yet another story, not at such length. And this one is actually about me more than it's about Ronald Reagan. It has to do with the research that I did on Ronald Reagan. And I had been working on the Reagan book for some while. While I was, the, my projects tend to overlap. So I had started work on my Reagan project. I hadn't started writing, but I was reading and doing research. At the time that I was doing a book tour for a previous book, I was doing this book tour uh, for a book about Ulysses Green. And I was, and on these book tours, you give interviews and you do, you know, events at bookstores and all this. And, and I was uh, giving this radio interview uh, to a radio host in Chicago. And so we were talking about Ulysses Green. And at the end of the hour, he asked me a question that comes up all the time, this sort of thing. So what's your next project? And I said, I'm working on a book about Ronald Reagan. At which point, the radio host put his hand over the microphone. And he said, after we get off the air, there's something I need to tell you. So I'm thinking, hey, this is good. Because Chicago, Illinois, Reagan's from Illinois, and maybe with somebody who is sort of as recently deceased as Reagan, you always hope that you're going to run across somebody who knew somebody who knew Reagan, somebody who has some letters from Reagan. Uh, maybe I was, I was imagining, my mind was going fast, and I was imagining maybe this guy's aunt dated Reagan and has love letters or something like this. Maybe I can really break a story here. So the, the interview ends. And we get off the air, and I'm waiting. So what's he going to say? And he said, if you want to understand Ronald Reagan, there's one thing you need to keep in mind. Yeah? And he said, it's this, that Ronald Reagan was the son of an alcoholic father. And I didn't know how to respond to this because I didn't know if he thought he was giving me information I didn't already have, because I already knew this. 
In fact, everybody who's read either of Reagan's two memoirs knows this. He writes about it in his memoir. So not knowing what to say, I didn't say anything at all to see if he was going to say something more. And he did. And he went on to say, I speak as the son of an alcoholic father. And I will tell you that when you grow up in those circumstances, you develop a characteristic emotional attitude toward the world. The person on whom you want to rely most, the person you want to trust, the person you want to model yourself after, is utterly unreliable. And one day, He's tossing the baseball around in the backyard with you, and he's telling you funny stories about when he was a kid, and he's taking you out for ice cream, and you think he's the greatest guy in the world. And the next day, he's beating the living daylights out of you. And every morning when you wake up, you don't know which of those two fathers you're going to be dealing with. And a result of this, you don't trust anybody with your emotions. You keep them to yourself. And you build this, this wall around yourself. And you're very careful about letting anybody in. So I listened to him say this. And I said, well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that with me. And I, I thought, OK, this is an interesting perspective on this. I'm not going to take this guy's word for it, that this is Ronald Reagan but I will entertain the possibility as I continue my research. And I went back over some stuff, and I thought, okay, this is interesting. And I was on the lookout for evidence that would corroborate or perhaps disprove what I will call this hypothesis. Well, there were three pieces of evidence that I thought were especially revealing, and they tended to be corroborative. So one was a bit of evidence adduced by Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan was the one person that Ronald Reagan allowed inside that wall. Nancy Reagan was Ronald Reagan's entire emotional universe. He entrusted his emotions to her. He shared his life, his feelings with her to the exclusion of just about everybody else, including the children. The Reagan kids often felt they were left out. And sometimes they said they were left out because their father, their mother, were busy people. But they also sensed that there just wasn't emotional room in their, in their father's life for them. There's a telling moment in the life of Michael Reagan, who is Ronald Reagan's older son, uh, the, an adopted son with Reagan and his first wife, Jane Wyman. And Michael Reagan had a difficult childhood, and he bounced from school to school until it looked like he was never going to get a high school diploma. And he was at a boarding school, I think it was in Arizona at this point, and he was several, he was of the right age to graduate, but he didn't have the credits to graduate. But he managed to cut a deal with the headmaster of the school. And the deal was, if you can deliver your father to give the commencement address, we'll give you your diploma. <laughs> and so Michael calls home, wondering if this is going to fly with his dad. And his dad is thrilled. Oh my gosh, Michael's going to get out of high school. So, Reagan shows up, and he's, he's working the room like a politician with the graduate. And he says, hi, I'm Ronald Reagan. What's your name? Johnny Smith. Hi, I'm Ronald Reagan. What's your name? Mary Jones. Hi, I'm Ronald Reagan. What's your name? Dad was Michael. He didn't even recognize his own son. So, but that's not the evidence. The evidence is actually, in Nancy Reagan's memoir, Nancy says that she was closer to Ronnie, as she always called him, than anybody else was. She always called Reagan Ronnie. Do you know what Reagan always called Nancy? <laughs> Mommy. Oh. I'm getting a few of these oh's. I wanted to hear what the reaction was. When I tell my 19-year-old students 
there's a universal. <laughs> I'm not going to, I don't know exactly what to make of this. But I will say that Nancy Reagan says in her memoir, even though he was closer to me than to anyone else, there were those moments when I could feel that wall going up. And I knew that I just had to back off, that he wasn't going to share that part of himself with me. Now, Nancy was very astute. Nancy Reagan's memoir is one of the most revealing memoirs of any public memoir of the last, say, 50 years. Because she really is candid about herself. She's candid about her husband, about children, and everything. So if you're interested at all, you should read it. It's a good one. But it, does, it tended to corroborate what the radio host had suggested. The second piece of evidence comes from Reagan himself in his own memoir. And there's a moment that Reagan describes in the memoir. He is a kid. And he has already said that his dad's this alcoholic, but he, Reagan treats it the way he says his mother taught him and his brother to treat it as an illness. Your dad's sick, and so we need to be sympathetic. We don't need to blame, we shouldn't blame him. He's doing the best he can. And Reagan the kid, excuse me, Reagan the memoir writer acts as though he buys that argument. Reagan the kid seems to have mixed feelings because Reagan mentions a specific moment when he's 11 years old. Again, living in Dixon, Illinois. It's in the middle of winter. It, the temperature is below zero outside. There's snow on the ground. He has stayed after school. He went down to the local YMCA and he's coming home. And it's just getting dark as the, the temperature is falling even more. He turns off the sidewalk into the walkway up to the front doorstep of the house and he sees his father passed out drunk in the snow. And this Reagan describes this in his memoir. And in his memoir, he says, and I stood there for a moment and I asked myself, should I just leave him here? Now, Reagan didn't follow up by saying what that obviously meant. Should I leave him here in the snow to freeze to death? He quickly goes on to, well, I decided to pick him up and drag him in, and so I did. And it's just a moment in the memoir. But Reagan acknowledges that for this moment at least, this 11-year-old kid entertains the idea that his life might be better if his father were dead. You know? And that is an awfully heavy thing for a kid that age to be thinking about his father. Last bit of evidence. And this is another part of the unlocking the secret of Ronald Reagan. See, I'm trying to, to explain to you that I think the enigma of Ronald Reagan is not what made Reagan tick. It's what made Reagan successful, which is a quite different thing. But this last thing about what made Reagan tick and what made him successful. When Reagan was little, he was an awkward child. He was badly nearsighted. He had this alcoholic father. He had an older brother who was a better athlete, had more friends, you know, better in school, the whole thing. And so the younger son is feeling out of sorts, out of friends, just out of place until, until his mother who was active in the local, her local church, Disciples of Christ. She did lots of things around the church, partly to get out of the house from her drunken husband, but she did various things. And among the things she did, she used to put on musicals and skits and little plays. And she dragged young Ronnie, or they called him Dutch because the family didn't have any money, and she cut his hair by the old method, putting a bowl on the head and cutting around it, so he had this little Dutch boy haircut. So she drags him along. And some of the people there said, oh, cute little kid. And something inspired her to put him on stage. And Reagan, writing his memoir at the age of 80, remembers this moment 75 years before. And he describes it almost as though it was yesterday. And he says, he got up on stage and people laughed. And he said, it was like music to my ears. And Reagan was one of those people who wanted to sort of get out of his own personal life by getting in front of people. And the world was better when he was on stage, when he could make people laugh. Now, you laughed when I told you those two Reagan jokes. And this was part of 
what made Reagan the person that he was, what made him the politician that he was. One way of interpreting Reagan's life and career is that he's constantly searching for a new, a bigger stage. So the stage goes from the basement of the church when he's five years old to his grade school and then high school drama club where he stars in the various plays. He goes off to college and he's in plays there. He becomes this radio announcer and he goes to Hollywood. And he's got this great big stage in Hollywood. But it doesn't quite measure up to his hopes, his ambitions. Why not? Well, I think the reason that Reagan's film career never went any farther than it did was precisely that emotional wall he built around himself. I've never been an actor and I don't know anything to speak of about the theory of acting, but it seems to me that if you are going to portray deep emotions, there has to be some place in your own emotional self that you're willing to go. And maybe you're portraying uh, an emotion of grief or something that in the, the movie role is caused by this, but you have to be able to go something, you remember grief or something from your own life, and then you just sort of transpose it. But Reagan wouldn't go to that deep emotional place. He kept that off limits. And for this reason, Reagan, as Samuel Goldwyn said, made a great best friend, but he never made the great lead actor. So his film career fades out. But then, he, well, he gets this diminished audience, this diminished stage when he's working for GE. But then he gets this second chance. He gets this new screen test for the new stage, the new audiences of politics. And finally, he, be, he has the biggest stage one can imagine. He is this world figure. So, becoming a politician, going into politics, is, I think, in large part, a function of Reagan's desire for a stage. Now, that gets him to politics, but it doesn't explain why he was successful. And I'm running out of time, so I will summarize briefly what his success was, and then I'll explain why it happened. But Reagan's, I account Reagan one of the two great presidents of the 20th century. And by great, I mean had the greatest impact on the way Americans live and the way the world operates. And the two presidents of the 20th century that changed things for Americans in the world, Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. And they are, in some ways, bookends to the 20th century. So Franklin Roosevelt is one who became president at a moment when the conservative order of the 1920s, the conservative order that looked to the private sector, that looked to the capitalist economy, to find solutions to America's problem, that order had collapsed with the great stock market crash and the Great Depression. And Americans were looking for a change. So they elected Franklin Roosevelt, who pushed the pendulum of American politics. It had been sort of on the right sector, gave it a push to the left toward greater government involvement in people's lives. To, to put it very succinctly, you are a liberal in American politics if you think that government is the solution to problems. You are a conservative in American politics if you think that government is the problem. And from Franklin Roosevelt's election in 1932, through the 40s, 50s, 60s, early 70s, Americans bought into the idea that government was the solution. That's what the New Deal was all about. That's what the Great Society of the 1960s was all about. By the late 1970s, the pendulum had gone about as far as American voters wanted it to go. And by 1980, when they elected Ronald Reagan, they were starting to think, no, no, government is not the solution. Government has become the problem. Government has overreached. And Ronald Reagan, after being elected in 1980, announced in his first inaugural address, he said exactly this. He said that government is the problem. And that's the essence of American conservatism. And I would argue that we are still in that age of Reagan. And in fact, if you look at the primary campaign, certainly on the Republican side, the candidates who are having the greatest success are the ones who are saying the government is exactly the problem. And voters are responding to the idea that we want somebody who doesn't have anything to do with government. So that's, I'll call that Reagan's success in the domestic sphere. 
to give that pendulum a, a strong push in a conservative direction. Okay, push it back to the right. In the foreign policy sphere, well actually, Reagan's whole agenda as president could be summarized very briefly. Number one, shrink government at home. Number two, defeat communism abroad. Now, Reagan didn't exactly shrink government at home, although he did slow the rate of growth. And he changed the nature of the discussion. So Americans are not going to give up Social Security, and they're not going to give up Medicare. But since 1980, they have been very reluctant to add on to those programs. New, pro new federal programs came thick and fast in the 30s, again in the 50s and 60s. But since 1980, there have been very few new important federal programs. So the slowing of the rate of growth is important. On the foreign policy side, Reagan says we defeat communism abroad. That was a radical thing when Reagan became president. Because other presidents, from Harry Truman through Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, said we will contain communism, we will coexist with communism. Reagan said, no, no. Somebody asked him, what's your policy in the Cold War? Simple. We win, they lose. And Reagan gave a memorable speech when he stood before the Brandenburg Gate in 1987. And he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And the wall came down. Now, I have to tell you that Reagan did not do this all by himself. In fact, if not for Mikhail Gorbachev, the wall, I wouldn't say would still be standing. But one important thing that you learn when you study presidents is how little control presidents actually have over the world around them. Ronald Reagan did not cure the stagflation of the 1970s. If any single person did, it was Paul Volcker, the head of the Federal Reserve. Ronald Reagan did not bring down the Berlin Wall. If anybody did, it was Mikhail Gorbachev and those thousands of East Berliners who risked their lives going up against the guards and going up against the wall. But Reagan was the catalyst. And so, shortly after Reagan left office, the wall came down. And if there's a single president who is most responsible for the defeat of communism in the Cold War, it was Reagan. Again, that's a big if. But if there was one, Reagan's the one. So that's the nature of Reagan's success. How did he accomplish it? This gets me back to the opening. And, and here I will sort of reflect from Reagan's career to the election season that is currently unfolding. I told you the story about Reagan and the bagel. That's one he told on himself. I told you the story about Reagan and St. Peter and the politician. Again, he told that on himself. But one of the striking things about Reagan, in fact, striking to the point of essential uniqueness about Ronald Reagan, uniqueness in American political experience. Reagan is that very rare, I'd go so far as to say, unique example of an optimistic conservative. Conservatives in American politics, I would say conservatives generally, tend to be pessimists. Well, think about it for a minute. Conservatives are conservative because they think that change is usually for the worse. That's basically the definition of a pessimist. Reagan somehow managed to be a conservative but also an optimist. And Reagan really did believe that America's best days were ahead. Now, this was not an easy thing to believe after the 1960s and 1970s. Some of you, I'm going to guess, were old enough to remember those decades. <laughs> and the 60s with the riots in the cities, and the 70s with Vietnam and stagflation and the hostages in Iran and the whole business. It was easy to think, as Jimmy Carter articulated in what became known as the Malay's speech, that Americans are going to have to get used to less. They're going to have to lower the thermostats. They're going to have to drive less. They're not going to be able to simply assume that every generation is going to be better than the generation before. Now, I remember listening to that speech, and I thought it was a good speech. I thought it was a very thoughtful speech. It was a disastrous speech politically, because that's not what Americans want to hear. Americans want to hear that their country is the greatest on earth, and it's going to be better next year than it is this year. And Reagan understood that. And Reagan was able to say that because he believed it. Now. He was optimistic. He also, he also had a sense of humor. Reagan was someone that people thought they would like. Reagan was approachable. Reagan was, some of you will remember, Hubert Humphrey. And Hubert Humphrey was sort of the happy warrior. 
Well, Reagan was, in essence, the philosophy of Barry Goldwater married to the persona of Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> he was this happy warrior, but a conservative. And a number of the candidates, all Republicans these days, you know, like to channel Ronald Reagan, at least that's what they say, because Reagan is sort of the last hero of the Republican Party. But none of them so far has been able to pull off the imitation, be, and I'll end with um, a confession. And the confession is, so my book was published last May, and this was back when all the Republican hopefuls were still hopeful. <laughs> and I was doing the rounds of media in New York. And in fact, so on a couple of days, I basically camped out at the News Corporation headquarters, which is where all the Fox News shows originate. And so I went from one of the Fox News to the next Fox News, Fox and Friends, Fox Business, Fox, you know, the whole thing, Fox in the morning, Fox in the afternoon, if I had. <laughs> and, and so the, the question came up again and again. So how would Reagan do in the election this year? Or which of the candidates today is most like Ronald Reagan? And in answer to that question, I, I gave an answer that, when, you, when I tell it to you now, it's going to seem remarkably ignorant and short-sighted. <laughs> but remember, this is last May. <laughs> so I said, I was asked, so which of the candidates is most like Ronald Reagan? And I said, I admitted, that this is going to sound a little bit strange, given the fact that this candidate is not polling particularly well, but I think the candidate who's most like Ronald Reagan is former Texas Governor Rick Perry. And he really wasn't polling very well. But I said, think about it for a minute. Because, first of all, big state governor, successful big state governor, that's important. Uh, they're both, actually, there's a kind of physical resemblance between the two. They're both sort of conventionally good-looking men. And I said, the last thing is that Perry has a sense of humor. Well, so, 10 days later, Perry drops out of the race. <laughs> and my first reaction to this was, oh, I guess that shows it. Rick Perry's no Ronald Reagan, which is true enough. But then the more I thought about it and the more things unfolded, I said, no, no, actually the big difference is that 2016 is not 1980. And I think that is the bigger difference because the electorate in 1980 was willing to accept this happy conservative. The electorate in 2016, certainly on the Republican side, seems to be sort of out for blood and there is this anger that is expressed. How would Ronald Reagan fare today if he were running? It's a really good question. As a historian, one of the things I say again and again is don't import people from the past into the present and expect to see anything meaningful. They were successful in the past because they fit the past times and times change. But I'll fudge that answer a little bit to say, well, Ronald Reagan, I think, could be a very appealing candidate today because he was simply an appealing guy. And he did have this sort of 100% conservative rhetoric. He knew how to talk the conservative talk. And I said, so if Reagan were running as a candidate, I think he would compete very well today. Ex unless, unless he had already been president. Because that brings in something entirely different. Reagan understood the difference between being a candidate and being a president. He understood that when you are a candidate, you promise the moon. When you are a president, you accept far less than the moon. I did a bunch of interviews for the book. And among the people I interviewed was James Baker, who was Reagan's chief of staff and then his secretary of the treasury. And Baker told me, he said, because I, I remember this, because it was so, the, the figure of speech he used was so striking. He said, if Reagan told me once, he told me 15,000 times, I would rather get 80% of what I want than go over the cliff with my flags flying. That was Reagan. That was Reagan the pragmatist as president. And Reagan understood that in a pluralist democracy, you don't get everything that you want. Reagan won a thunderous reelection in 1984. He got nearly 60% of the vote, which means that he lost 40% of the vote. And Reagan understood those 40% of the people who voted against him had a right to their opinion, and they had a right to a say in the way the country was governed. And he wasn't going to try to ram his full program down their throats. 
If he could get 80%, that was a great day. He'd take that to the bank. He could always come back again tomorrow and try to get 80% of the rest. So he would make progress that way, which made him a very effective president. But it would have meant that if Reagan, as president, was having to defend that record today as a candidate, then he doesn't look so good. Because there is this all or nothing demand, especially in the primary season. You compromised away 20%, what were you doing? Well, no, I got 80%, that's not enough. So anyway, I'm gonna stop there. And if you have questions, I'll be delighted to try to answer them. And of course, if, there's any, if there are any questions that you have about Ronald Reagan that I have not had a chance to answer, the answers are all in the book. <laughs>
a few programs. What Reagan got in his first year was tax cuts written in stone. Tax cuts are actually an easy sell. Uh, the other side, the Democrats will typically complain, but they won't complain if they're tax cuts for everybody. And there were tax cuts across the board. And so the top rate, the one that got the most press, went from 70% to 29%, a huge cut. But middle class taxes went down as well. Tax cuts, I say, are a comparatively easy sell because when members of Congress go back to their constituencies and they ask, what have you done for me lately? Hey, I cut your taxes. Everybody likes that. The much harder deal is the spending cuts. And so Reagan made this crucial tactical decision in 1981. He knew he could get the tax cuts, as I say, written in stone, and he could get promises of future spending cuts. And he was willing to accept that. If he had maintained the link that, until Reagan became president, conservatives always made, the link between tax cuts and spending cuts, more precisely, you don't cut taxes until you've got the spending cuts in the bank, all written in stone. Because of this dynamic, tax cuts are easy, spending cuts are hard. But Reagan was willing to accept, in 81, tax cuts now in exchange for a hamburger on Wednesday. <laughs> Some of you will remember that, but I mean, in exchange for spending cuts next year or the year after. The spending cuts next year or the year after never happened. And Reagan always blamed Tip O'Neill and those profligate Democrats. <laughs> but Reagan should have been, and I think in his heart of hearts he was, enough of a realist to know that that's not the way to do it if you're going to insist on a balanced budget. So Reagan, and especially Don Regan, his then, that is Beagle, not Bagel, Don Regan, <laughs> um, his first Treasury Secretary, sort of rationalized away deficits. And Regan was the one who said deficits don't matter in the short term because they were hoping that it would un unleash the productive powers of America and the tax cuts would pay for themselves, which they didn't. But it is to Reagan that we owe or can blame the conservative, I mean, the deficits of the 1980s, which ballooned far out of control. Reagan's administration doubled the national debt in real terms. So from George Washington through Jimmy Carter, the debt was this big. From Reagan, it was that big. And it has continued to grow, partly because the Republican Party is no longer the party of balanced budgets. It's the party of tax cuts. There's still the lip service to the balanced budget, but you're not serious about a balanced budget unless you're willing to withhold tax cuts until you get the spending cuts. So Reagan made this crucial decision, which we've had to live with ever since. Very good question. So now we're going to adjourn, right, to the reception. Yes. Before we adjourn, all in favor of inviting him back. <laughs> Maybe have more conversation with him. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Okay, that's fine. Good evening. So did you like it? Yes. Very good. I think that you everybody is trying to get down, but you gotta kind of serious. You're not gonna like it. You still just like the quality. But it's I think it's no longer possible. Oh yeah, for book club. Thanks for coming. Oh good. Good evening. What's your name? Cameron. 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 Nice to meet you, Cameron. 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 Thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the 2016 Authors Series for the Citizens of Hudson. Mm -hmm.
for a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653-2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.